Greetings and welcome to Between the Carceral University and Police Free Futures. In the wake of national discourse about the future of policing, many higher education leaders are reconsidering their institution's relationship to municipal and campus police. Student activists have raised critical questions about campus police department budgets, hiring practices, and whether police are needed as first responders on college campuses at all. Concerns about student safety, campus crime, and conjecture surrounding the university's inability to resolve crises if campus police structures are altered have guided institutional responses to growing criticism. As an attempt to address this social and political movement, this virtual event brings together concerned campus and community stakeholders to discuss the many and varied ways contemporary colleges and universities create the conditions that necessitate policing and prisons. My name is Keenan Colquitt. I am the program lead for the Diversity Scholars Network, which is a core initiative of the National Center for Institutional Diversity. The Diversity Scholars Network is a scholarly community committed to advancing understandings of historical and contemporary social issues related to identity, difference, culture, representation, power, oppression, and inequality as they occur and affect individuals, groups, communities, and institutions. We are proud to sponsor this program in collaboration with Campus Abolition Research Labs and NCID's Anti-Racism Collaborative, the University of Michigan's strategic space for engagement around anti-racism research and scholarship, and is part of the Provost Anti-Racism Initiative. On behalf of the Diversity Scholars Network, the Anti-Racism Collaborative, and the Campus Abolition Research Lab, we welcome you. We begin this presentation with a land acknowledgement. The University of Michigan is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people. In 1817, the Three Fires Confederacy made the largest single land transfer to the University of Michigan. This was offered ceremonially as a gift through the treaty at the foot of the rapids. Through these words of acknowledgement, their contemporary and ancestral ties to the land and their contributions to the university are renewed and reaffirmed. Before we begin, I'd like to share a few reminders with you all. Live closed captioning is available. Click the CC icon and select view subtitle. This session is being recorded and will be available on NCID's website following the session. A transcript will be provided on the website with the event recording. Please submit any questions using the Q&A tool in your Zoom toolbar. Engage this topic online with hashtag NCID anti-racism and follow us on Twitter at UMichNCID. Please help build this Diversity Scholars Network program and other anti-racism collaborative initiatives by completing our post-event survey displaying in your browser immediately after the discussion ends. For more information on the DSN, this is available on our website. And now to our panelists. Dr. Devarian Baldwin. Dr. Baldwin is a Pauli e. rather distinguished professor of American studies and founding director of the Smart Cities Laboratory at Trinity College. He is the author of several books, including most recently, In the Shadow of the Ivory Tower, How Universities Are Plundering Our Cities. Baldwin is a public-facing scholar with deep investments in social justice. He serves on the Executive Committee for Scho of Scholars of Social Justice and as a contributing member of the Scholars for a New Deal in Higher, ed in higher Education. His uh, contemporaries, um, have been featured in numerous outlets, including N uh, NB NBC News, PBS, The History Channel, USA Today, Washington Post, and Time. Welcome. Dr. Aaron Corbett is the CEO of Second Chance Educational Alliance, Inc., and the director of Quinnipiac University Prison Project. She has spent almost two decades in education access uh, in a number of roles with experience as a uh, independent school administration, and, uh, enrichment programs and post-secondary financial aid, her commitment to expanding post-secondary opportunities for all populations 
has served as the foundation of her professional endeavors. Dr. Corbett has authored publications on the importance of investing in educational success of Black women and girls, contemporary issues of civil rights and federal higher education, and the need to deconstruct and disrupt the prison recidivism paradigm. Welcome. Kamaria Porter. Kamaria is a PhD candidate in higher education and a lab manager for University Responses to Sexual Assault Project in the Department of Sociology at the University of Michigan. Kamaria's research interests include racial and gender inequalities in higher education, especially institutional response to sexual assault, graduation, uh, graduate education, and faculty experiences. Her dissertation examines how perceptions of legal systems across race affects student decisions to report sexual violence to their university. Welcome to you. And, uh, and David Helps. David is a PhD candidate in history at the University of Michigan and a research fellow with the Carceral State Project. In summer 2020, he contributed to the Detroit Justice Center's interactive report, Highway Robbery, how Metro Detroit cops and courts steer segregation and drive incarceration. His writing on policing and a police free future has appeared in The Nation, Washington Post, Foreign Policy, among other outlets. As a member of the Graduate Employees Organization, a local chapter of the American Federation of Teachers, he participated in a week long strike in 2020 for a safe and just pandemic response. He currently co-chairs the union's abolition caucus and works towards the transformation of public safety at U of M. And our moderator for this event, Dr. Charles Davis III. Dr. Davis is the third generation educator and an artist committed to the lives, love, and liberation of everyday Black people. Dr. Davis is currently an assistant professor at the, Center for a at the Center for the Study of Higher Education and Post-Secondary Education at the University of Michigan, where his research and teaching broadly focus on issues of race, racism, and resistance in education and its social con context. Additionally, Dr. Davis is a 2001 awardee of the National Academy of Education, Spencer Foundation Postdoctoral Fellowship, as well as a two 2022 Anti-Racism Collaborative Research and Community Impact Fellow, both of which support his research on law enforcement alternatives to safety and security on campus and beyond. So to that, I welcome you all and Dr. Davis, the floor is yours. Brother Keenan, thank you so much uh, to my colleagues joining me and to our guests. Thank you so much for being here and for your time and energy to this timely and important conversation. In the wake of the ongoing state and state sanctioned violence disproportionately impacting racially and other minoritized communities, particularly after the murder of George Floyd in May 2020, colleges and universities, as well as municipalities, have begun to consider departments are trained, <clears throat> excuse me, of uh, how police departments are trained, allocated public resources, and perform their everyday duties. Still, these considerations, while driven um, from the demands of grassroots organizers and collectives, have continued the longstanding pattern of performative and non-performative gestures that fall short of the demands for investment in the institution of policing and investments into building strong communities with the resources and supports necessary for improving the material conditions in which folks are expected to live, work, and learn. As data from the Bureau of Justice Statistics uh, campus law enforcement surveys demonstrate, 75% of college university campuses with storm police officers are also permitted to carry sidearms. Among those institutions, 80% have the power to patrol and 86% of officers have the power to make arrests in jurisdictions beyond the formal boundaries of campus. Additionally, since 1990, nearly 100 institutions are reported to have participated in the Department of Defense 1033 program that transfers military grade weapons to police departments around the country. Lest we also forget police-involved killings of vulnerable students and Black residents by campus police at Georgia Tech University, the University of Cincinnati, and Portland State University in recent years, as well as other dispatches of university police in Minneapolis and Philadelphia in the wake of extrajudicial killings of Black people by municipal police. Altogether, while staggering, police are but a single point along the carceral continuum in which colleges and universities 
and are an intricate uh, rather than a tangential part. As Johnson does not offer in their recent article on the college prison nexus, the carceral state can be broadly understood as a network of multiple and intersecting institutions, including but not limited to physical jails or prisons, and also state agencies like child and welfare services, immigration, and not-for-profit organizations that have acquired the capacity to police and punish mostly racially and ethnically minoritized people and those from economically disenfranchised backgrounds. When considering the specificity of campus carcerality, we are drawn to consider the ways higher education is both an apparatus and an extension of the carceral state in ways that not only facilitate logics of surveillance, control, domination, and punishment, but also the ways it creates the conditions that necessitate that policing of social, symbolic, and spatial boundaries between campuses and the often already vulnerable communities near or within which they reside. Therefore, the central concern of our discussion today is to wrestle with the realities of our current state of affairs as it relates to the contemporary carceral university and otherwise possibilities for higher education to reimagine itself as a life-affirming institution, rather than reinforcing the notion that universities and prisons sit in opposition to one another, whereas the former is presumed to be the domain of solutions while the other is seen as a consequence of society as the domain of problems, we are joined together by the recognition as Harnity and Moton have articulated as a necessity to finally see that the university produces incarceration as a product of its negligence, that a decarcerated police and police-free world necessitates a decarcerated and police-free university, or perhaps the absence of the university as a single side of post-secondary possibility altogether and the presence of higher and adult learning that is rooted in the neoliberal rejection that reorders the placement of people over profits, productivity, and prestige. And so with that, I'd like to welcome into the conversation our colleagues here. And David, I'd like to begin with you. Um, in thinking about this as a historian, um, what are some important links between municipal and campus police that exist that might help us understand the ways uh, they are more similar than perhaps they are different? Um, how is the racial legacy of municipal policing shaped how policing function in the college and university context? Yeah, thanks, Charles, and, and thanks to, to Charlotte and Keenan and everyone else who has you know, helped organize this conversation. Um, I feel really honored to be able to kick us off with this question. I think the first thing that we can say about um, the relationship between campus policing and, and municipal policing is that for most of their history, they weren't separate. There wasn't, um, you know, the idea of campus policing as distinct from city police departments is a, a relatively new occurrence. And I think that matters for a number of reasons, one of which to be able to say, well, the origins of the one are the origins of the other, but also to be able to say, um, the current status quo in which, uh, you know, Charles laid out for us the, the percentage of police departments, the percentage of universities that have police departments, have armed police departments that are sworn to make arrests, it's a relatively new development. And so there are other ways in which universities have functioned and, and could function in the future. So the example I think that, um, you know, I know best would be the University of Michigan, which didn't actually have an armed sworn campus police force until 1990. Um, it had had uh, other iterations, but for most of its history had relied on local county and state police to do the work of enforcing public safety policy. Mm -hmm. And in 1990, when they created uh, the Department of Public Safety with an armed um, sworn police force, it, it was contentious. There was you know, a mass sit-in, um, people held teach-ins, they occupied the dean's office and things like that. And I think a lot of people saw it as um, uh, a, re a reaction to an increase over the course of the 1970s and 1980s by anti-racist and especially anti-apartheid activism, specifically on the University of Michigan campus. So um, a lot of people at the time, students and, and workers made the connection to the ways in which um, the university was responding to um, increasingly militant um, activism by students and, and workers wanting the university to divest from, from apartheid South Africa. But I think we can also situate that in, uh, in the year 1990 in another way, which is the way in which public universities like the University of Michigan have increasingly come to cater to out of state and international students who pay higher tuition and the ways in which they've sought to attract those students and, and their parents with uh, new types of amenities that previously were, were not things that um, were at most secondary to the way in which universities sort of devoted their resources and saw their mission. So, you know, luxury dorms, you know, more elaborate cafeterias, sports uh, um, venues and things like that um, are now a, a huge part of what universities devote their, their time and their money and their space and their real estate towards, right? And so what that means is that all of that is often backed by an increased police presence. So uh, 
in the case of the University of Michigan, there were some high profile crimes that occurred in Ann Arbor in the late 1980s that led to a story in USA Today in which it called the University of Michigan the third most dangerous campus in the United States mm -hmm. based on a sort of, you know, some, some exceptional um, examples of violence that, that took place in the community. Um, and we saw the regents and we saw the president respond very seriously to this. And actually it was something that helped move the needle that the university up until that point had uh, resisted the creation of an armed um, campus police force and relied on a relatively small number of, of city uh, police to, to do public safety work. And that was one of the things that sort of pushed um, things. And that matters, I think, also, and, and you know, Devarian can speak to the, the sort of um, economic history of this, but it, it, the university was so dependent on um, disproportionately white and wealthy students and, and families, in part because of the ways in which um, in large part, the ways in which public funding had been totally, but had bottomed out. So in 1960, 78% of the university's general fund came directly from the state of Michigan. Tuition made up about 10% of, of, the, of the general fund. Today, uh, only 13% of the general fund comes from the state of Michigan. And, and the bulk of it now is tuition. Um, and, a, and a disproportionate amount of that tuition comes from um, the higher tuition that's charged to out of state and international students. So when we see universities are put in this sort of uh, bind in which they become dependent on um, disproportionately white and wealthy and out of state students and, and, and their families who are um, made to be sort of student consumers or parent consumers, those parents and students then make certain types of demands on the way in which uh, public order and public safety ought to look on campus. And what we've seen to this day, I think, um, especially when the university um, uh, uh, created this task force um, in order to sort of rethink the way that public safety was talked about. Some of the loudest voices have been from um, from from those communities who have you know said, "Well, I'm going to take my money under the University of Michigan. I'm not going to donate money. I'm not going to pay my my students um, tuition." And actually have this real sort of the customer is always right mentality in a way that when you funded universities, when universities were overwhelmingly funded by taxpayer dollars in, in a general way to serve a, a public in, interest. Um, when you take that away, you create these sort of anti-democratic claims that people are able to make, which often manifest as claims for more police, more surveillance, more security cameras, um, more crime alerts and these sorts of things um, that, that, as I said at the top, are, are actually a pretty re relatively recent development in the history of higher education. Yeah, Dave, thank you. Uh... For that and and the variant, you know, as David was talking and thinking about your work, I'm, I'm anxious to kind of see and hear your thoughts. Um, and given your work, right, which has extensively explored the relationship between university expansion and urban renewal and the role of policing in metropolitan cities, um, David kind of charted for us sort of a change over time. But actually, you speak to this being very germane, right, to the development of college universities in this urban context. So I'm wondering if you could sort of help us uh, make sense of how policing and the boundaries between campus and communities in which they reside um, both shape the experiences of everyday people, but how that is really embedded into the foundation of what many of these institutions represent. No, thank you so much, Charles. Thank you everyone, my uh, illustrious colleagues on this call, on this panel, and for everyone uh, for attending, taking time out of your day to attend this conversation, which is vital. Um, I just want to repeat in a variation what you said earlier, Charles, about the statistics around campus policing. I think we take it for granted or we understand it within a very limited context of our own campuses. But just to be clear, most 75% of schools, that includes public and private, have campus police. Nearly all carry guns and about nine in 10 have arrest and patrol jurisdictions beyond the main campus, beyond the main campus. I just want to be really, really clear about that. And that last part is really critical for the way in which I look at policing and urban renewal and uh, uh, kind of town gown relationships. So, so let's, let's just, just be very upfront about, well, well what's the idea of policing, um, of campus policing? The idea is that campus policing is marketed, as David's pointed out, um, these figures are marketed as agents of student and, in continue, and increasingly now, not just student, but community safety as their jurisdiction extends out into these neighborhoods. That's the idea. But when we look, let's just be just very basic for a minute. What are the major crimes in campus areas, whether urban or college town? The major crimes in campus areas are sexual violence and substance abuse, and sometimes vandalism and assault on the part of students, not so-called locals, 
or residents or those in the town or townies or however, whatever, whatever phrase you want, the coded phrase you want to use for black and brown folk in most cases, but not always. But uh, the biggest criminals in campus areas, especially at PWIs, are PWIs, predominantly white folks. And, and, and so, so when we have this, just framing it in that way changes and begs the question about, well, what are the function of police? So, so, so if the major criminals are police, and yet we talked about earlier about um, the announcements of crimes, we, and you mentioned Michigan having a number of high profile crimes in the 1990s. The irony of this is that, well, what crimes were? Because there are crimes happens on campus every day. But student crimes are, are the, the approach of the police is to hide student crime, to bury student crime. And then on the other side, we see an amplification of crime at the intersection between campus and community. So, so we, we begin asking, well, well, if the idea of campus policing is student and community safety, and the biggest crimes are student-driven sexual violence and substance abuse and vandalism and assault, then, then what is the, why are police campus, why do we have campus police? Some would say, well, it's an issue of capacity. We need more police. That was, that was the recent response. Even though you have a million cameras in New York City in the subways, they said, well, we need more police after the, after the tragic shooting that just happened a couple of days ago. Um, but, but I would say the issue is not, especially in the campus police setting, the issue is not uh, 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 capacity. The issue is intent because the function of campus police, it was never to police crime. And, and in my work, it's been clear to demonstrate, especially in urban campuses, but also in college town campuses as well, like Ann Arbor, the real function here, especially because they, Ann Arbor, Madison, Charlottesville are becoming increasingly, increasingly second tier urban spaces when people can't afford to live in New York or LA or the places, that the function of campus police is serving as a frontline security force in the control of areas targeted for university expansion. That this is a racialized political economic framework that we must understand. So for example, when um, students rallied to protest uh, the creation of a private security force on the part of Johns Hopkins, and they were using UChicago as their model, the biggest police force, the second largest private security force in the world outside of the Vatican, that's UChicago. So Johns Hopkins and other schools, they use UChicago as their model. But when students and residents uh, protested and occupied the campus buildings in 2019, just before the, the pandemic, um, uh, State Senator uh, uh, Mary Washington looked around and she looked at the ways in which private campus police, but also public police, as a public school police, as a quasi-private phenomena. She's like, these are institutions, these are entities that police with very limited public oversight, or in the case of public school, private schools, no public oversight. She described this as putting a Vatican City in the middle of Baltimore. What that means is a basically an independent republic with no public oversight in the middle of a, um, a expanding university ex uh, campus in a largely black and brown neighborhood, or in some cases, poor white neighborhoods. So. So in cities across the country, armed campus police have been given jurisdiction wherever there is a campus development. Or they hold jurisdiction in the case of New Haven or Cincinnati previously over the whole city. At the very moment that we're seeing the rise in the 90s, and I want to add to David's um, analysis, there's another piece to the 90s. This is what we see is the rise of what we're calling the knowledge economy. The conversion of academic research um, in, in areas like uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, uh, health, health sciences, uh, uh, um, uh, software, uh, military industrial weaponry, all this research is being converted into profits and patents that's going back to the university to compensate for the shrinking contributions of states to universities. A major part of attracting the best and brightest to do this knowledge work in this new economy is building out what, what, what the Wexford Development Corporation calls knowledge communities or innovation corridors. And we've heard these phrases all over the country right now that are a mixture of workshops, retail, uh, uh, high-end high -end housing, nightlife to attract these uh, researchers, uh, their families, students, 
directly in what had been divested neighborhoods of color. These basically university citadels, these mini republics in the middle of black and brown neighborhoods. So in short, when we look at campus policing, the real function here is that they are serving as a parastate. The front arms of a parastate with the university at the helm. These universities have used and they've embraced a velvet hammer approach to university expansion as a way to generate wealth that's hoarded on these campuses. Campuses that are, in, ter in terms of property value, tax exempt. So these are uh, uh, tax-free zones of wealth development that is extracting wealth from surrounding neighborhoods and is surrounded by a campus police force. So these schools have embraced a velvet hammer approach to expansion where they govern parts of our cities by deploying the brute strength of campus police alongside the soft power of upscale housing, retail, and workshops to an act of violent confiscation and control of local communities governed by university interests, whether it be private schools or public schools. And the results have been black dehumanization and sometimes even death. So I'll stop with that. Yeah, thank you uh, so much for that. Um, brother, I know you're not technically a higher ed scholar, but we might try to have to get you over here uh, with, with all of that genius. I really appreciate that framing and, and even speaking to right that this is not a historical but contemporary phenomenon as you and I both know, and I think others are aware, right, what's going on in Philadelphia and has been going on in Philadelphia for many years, um, very much coming to a head, right, with the work that's happening to try to save one of those last frontiers of affordable housing in the University City townhomes there in West Philly. Um, and as you mentioned, the, the various shapes that that's taken after already displacing black folks from the black bottom, re relocating some of them and then displacing them effectively again, right, uh, either by their complicity or negligence, as, as we talked about earlier. Uh, Kamari, I want to bring you in here. Um, you know, Darian sort of signaled, um, you know, this discrepancy between sort of the public perspective on what constitutes various crime in these particular locales and the reality that much of that is stuff that happens on campus, particularly thinking about uh, campus sexual violence. And so as this discourse is widened, right, many questions have been raised about the efficacy of policing um, in responding to issues about intimate partner and sexual violence. And given your sort of close um, understanding, right, of students' experiences um, as victims and survivors, I'm wondering what are some important considerations for understanding the limitations of police as a first response? Um, and how do survivors um, with whom you've collaborated kind of describe those experiences, right? And I think part of this is trying to dig deeper and interrogate this idea that, oh, the absence of police renders, you know, women specifically, right, more vulnerable to sexual violence, despite the reality that more policing hasn't stopped that phenomenon from being a consistent part of college university life. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for um, having me in this space and to uh, build off and make connections across our different expertise. So I'm, I'm coming to this space as a former rape survivor advocate. So I would work with survivors in um, Chicago emergency rooms. I also come to this work um, as a researcher of campus sexual assault for the past 10 years. And um, through my project with the Department of Sociology, analyzing campus responses through policy, uh, but also my dissertation which focuses on Black women and Black non-binary students' experiences of sexual assault on predominantly white campuses and historically Black colleges and universities. Uh, and so through, through all of my knowledge um, that the police response has always been very lacking uh, in preventing or addressing sexual assault survivors, uh, particularly black women who have this fear that if they report sexual assault and sexual assault like sex and relationships is primarily within racial groups, intra-racial. So black women who already have um, negative experiences with police and the legal system um, growing up in predominantly Black areas, as we know, our housing is still very segregated. Um, the Black women that I talk to 
had these already negative interactions with police, whether they're, you know, playing in there as children and having the police called on them or um, previous experiences of childhood sexual abuse and sexual assault during high school. Um, and so they, came, they come with these already negative experiences and a collective consciousness that is particularly um, that is so robust because of all of the state violence black communities are experiencing and particularly the murder of black trans women they come to this experience and they 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 experience sexual assault and so the primary uh one of the primary findings in my research is that black women were caught in this double bind of fearing that if they did report sexual assault uh they would be either invalidated um as survivors of sexual assault because because we we do live in a rape culture that is um, that excuses, minimizes, and particularly um, doesn't care about the sexual harm that Black women experience um, because of damaging narratives about that that have that are rooted in white supremacism and and racial capitalism that oh you know. Black women aren't deserving of, of protection uh, or sexual autonomy. So they feared they would be invalidated um, as survivors, as Black women survivors. And it would be a waste of time and cause more harm. But they also feared that because they were reporting a Black male as, as an assailant, that the legal system they would become catalysts in the racist project of legal systems to incarcerate black bodies for any reason um, and play into narratives about the black community that would that would bring more state violence to to themselves to the person who assaulted them which was often someone that they knew um, or to their family members and friends who might want to take action in their own hands. And so black women who, who had been harmed, they were immediately put in the position to protect everyone else. And nobody is looking at them. Nobody is caring about them. The, the second thing that I wanted to say is that some of the participants I talked to did have interactions with police and um, and university officials, and all of all almost all of these interactions were were horrible. Um, it's the the multiple jurisdictions of um, campus and municipal police, so having to kind of bounce around all these different uh, interactions, telling your story over and over and over again, and then being um, scrutinized for any inconsistency. Um, police officers saying directly to survivors, there's no point of you reporting this. We're not gonna, nothing's gonna happen. And it's like, well, you're the person you're the ones who determine what happens. So you're basically saying, we're not gonna do anything. And what happened to you doesn't matter. And so those experiences were multiplied the harm of sexual assault. And because of fears that uh, friends and family members might take actions into their own hands, black women didn't disclose at all. And so um, even the people that, that they trust and could have used support from, they had to, they were silenced uh, by these multiple forces that are rooted in white supremacy, sexism, and the historical and contemporary treatment of black women survivors by the legal system.
Yeah, thank you for that. Um, a lot to consider and think about, right? But at, but at the heart of it, sort of recognizing, as we already sort of understand, uh, the extent to which there are severe limitations with the um, sort of policing and carceral approaches and, and remedy, right, that often engage in some levels of re-traumatization, as you've articulated, but also um, create aspects of continuing funneling, right, and the disproportionate impact of those who have committed many of these um, crimes and how that disproportionately plays itself out uh, racially. And so thinking about aspects of that uh, funnel, that continuation or expansion of the carceral continuum, uh, Aaron, I want to bring you in here, um, given your longstanding work sort of at this immediate intersection, right? And sort of as I alluded to at the beginning that often higher education and sort of, uh, you know, jails and prisons are put in opposition, right? And almost to the extent that one is providing some level of a solution, either preventative or after the fact um, for the other. Um, and so I'm wondering if, if you might speak to um, sort of your understanding of that, right? And, and more specifically, given that we conceptualize higher ed as sort of this important criteria or, or factor of social mobility in the public sphere, um, which I think includes some opportunities afforded to system involved youth as well as adults uh, to pursue degrees. Um, how would you talk about the relationship between higher education as well as the opportunity, but potential challenges that it presents for currently and formerly incarcerated folks? And I'm really thinking about as well sort of this notion of re-entry of right, what does it mean to be having been just involved entering into sort of this carceral apparatus, um, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the, the college or university? So I think, Charles, um, there, you know, you, you started uh, the, the lead into the question with what we sort of see in the field of higher ed and prison that universities see themselves as diametrically opposed to all that is a part of the carceral system when in fact they are partners. And, mm -hmm. and there are not enough people in the university setting and even within the higher ed and prison field who understand how closely related colleges and universities and prisons are, specifically if we look theoretically and ideologically at Goffman's idea of the total institution. Both of those, colleges and universities and prisons are total institutions. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is that, you know, if you, again, if you think about leadership at a college and leadership in corrections, you have someone on the top. So that's a chancellor, a commissioner, right? We have a chancellor of you know, Michigan schools, we have a commissioner of state DOCs. You then have, you know, presidents on campuses if you're in a state system. You have wardens in correctional facilities. You've got cabinets of those presidents in those university systems. You have deputy wardens in the correctional facility. There is so much similarity between how leadership is structured, between higher ed institutions and prisons, that it is foolhardy to say that we are diametrically opposed, we as higher ed are diametrically opposed to what is happening in prisons. Because we can also look at the ways that we take um, sort of a very elitist approach to higher ed in the classroom, especially in terms of instructional practice, and map that onto people who are incarcerated potentially re-traumatizing people who may have already had traumatizing K-12 experiences in the communities that they came from prior to incarceration. And so without a nuanced understanding of the interconnectedness of these two systems of higher ed and carcerality, we're not even really scratching the surface of what's really happening inside of the classroom and outside of the classroom, whether that's on the free world or inside, um, inside of a prison. In terms of what things look like for students, um, justice impacted students who are released, um, there are, as we know, many, many, many collateral consequences of conviction that those, those folks face. And most egregiously, I mean, there are tens of thousands, but most egregiously, are the in are the higher ed institutions that will uh, that will offer programs inside of prisons and not let the students who were in that prison program come to campus to finish their degree. That is completely antithetical to everything that we think we believe about higher education, access to higher education, the ability for education to be a, a pathway and entry to social mobility, um, increases in lifetime earnings, et cetera, et cetera. So we have, these tens of thousands of state sanctioned legislations, rules, policies, procedures that allow 
employers that allow housing people that allow occupational licensure boards to actively actively and proudly discriminate against people with criminal convictions. And so what you then can have is someone who has gone through a higher ed and prison program inside, has done the work, you know, has worked hard, has done all of the sacrifice, and they get out and they can't find a job in the field that they want because there are still all of these consequences that they are running up against. Um, there is a website, uh, the NICCC, National Inventory of Collateral Consequences of Conviction. You can look at collateral consequences at the state level. You can look at collateral consequences at the federal level. You can look at them by category. There's occupational licensure. There's stuff related to education. And you will see all of the barriers that justice impacted people, whether they were impacted as a youth or an adult. You'll start to see all of the ways that we say, look, freedom of life through education, except when you get out, you're not going to get a job. You're probably not going to find a place to live. Healthcare, good luck. May the odds be ever in your favor, right? So this is what universities are setting students up to do when they are not being as judicious about re-entry and that pathway as they should be. And so now um, higher ed institutions are trying to get into re-entry. First of all, y'all don't do residential life well, if we're being honest about it. So I don't, I don't want any higher ed institution that can't manage a dorm to try and build a whole re-entry program for people that have a complex set of unique needs that they have not had a chance to even think through, analyze, read about, learn about, et cetera. What higher ed institutions need to be doing is partnering and providing resources to community-based organizations that have been doing this work since Picture It Sicily 1912. There are organizations in every state that do re-entry work, whether it is re-entry work that comes out of a governor's office, a mayor's office, whether it's something in like the you know, municipal level. There are re-entry organizations and advocates who do re-entry work everywhere. There is absolutely no need for any higher ed institution to try and stick its nose in, build something to say they've built it, but then it's actually trash. And so what we need to do in higher ed, because we are so afflicted with hubris, is take a step back. We need to examine who is in our sphere, because as, um, as Dr. Baldwin was saying, there is always this precarious relationship between the university and the community. The university, the onus is on the university, especially if they are involved in higher ed and prison programs, the onus is on them to talk to the community, to bring the community in, to go into the community, to leverage the resources for the students that are going to be coming on their campuses once they are released. I'll just echo the chat and that, that was a word. Um, you give us a lot, as you always do, and we're so blessed to have you as a, as a part of this conversation. Um, and, and as you mentioned, right, like almost at every step of the way, I can sort of reflect on um, an article you wrote with Jared Wall that came out, I think, last year that even talks about even through just admissions, right? Like this, and part of that ban the box movement that's obviously proliferated in public discourse has not always made its way to higher ed, but that, you know, we even route through a whole different review process through this sort of like core, you know, deep core belief of deservingness, right? Of the merit of the individual, as you say, um, that is intricately a part of an access and equity conversation and yet not taken up seriously by the field of higher ed in terms of scholarship, but also practitioners of what do we mean when we actually say access, right? And equity for home. So I really appreciate you um, giving those thoughts and so being a bit uh, attentive to time there and recognizing some folks will leave us early. I want to turn uh, a bit now to thinking about sort of um, solutions or possibilities rather, perhaps not solutions, but possibilities. And so our work at the Campus Abolition Research Lab um, is something that's ongoing in a development with, you know, a community of folks in a broader conversation to think about um, what does it mean to talk about these things differently, to think about the university in different ways, and specifically thinking of campus abolition as a process of identifying, disrupting, and dismantling higher education sites, practices, policies, and procedures of the Carlsville University while collaboratively reimagining post-secondary education as a life-affirming institution, thinking about Ruth Wilson Gilmore's work, right, that abolition itself is not just about absence, but in fact about presence and the things that actually are more life-affirming. So I'm wondering for you all, given the different areas in which you find your work, um, 
thinking about abolition as a paradigm, how does it play into how we might reimagine the relationship between higher education and large use of carcerality? Um, and how do each of you think about the urgent need for pursuing alternatives to policing and prisons for the future of a campus and community safety? And Baron, I'd like to start with you first, um, and then we'll kind of go around as folks want to enter that conversation. I just want to say thanks so much, Strauss, and I'm, I'm going first out of not disrespect, but I have to leave early today. So I just want to say thank you all so much for having this conversation. I'm going to make my comments. I have to leave at three or yeah, three o'clock. So I um, just want to say that. But just to answer your question directly, uh, first of all, I like to talk about abolitionist futures by basing, by confronting what we currently have. And so as a continuation of what I said earlier, what do we currently have? We have a campus police system that over polices largely black and brown and poor white neighbors around campuses. They under police their actual actual activity on their campuses, right? I say this is the product of campus policing. If we look at this dynamic of how campus policing actually functions, it reveals to us that campus policing primarily functions as a branding mechanism because no university wants to publicize that it has a campus full of white criminals. So that's the reality. That's what we're confronting. That's what actually happens is we have campuses full of white criminals and police look the other way. And as a way to assuage their parents and, per and outside investors and families, they over police surrounding neighborhoods and they don't police well in either area. So this is the critical revelation about why if we talk about abolition anywhere, on one side, it should be campuses because the campus policing demonstrates the incoherency and inconsistency of what actually happens, happens when it comes to campus police. But there's another reason why we talk about uh, abolition at universities. They actually have the capacity to engage in abolition probably better than any other institution in Western society. Why? Well, first of all, we come with one another fact. I love my facts, right? So nine out of 10, this is just broad generally, nine out of 10 uh, uh, campus uh, calls do not require an armed response. Nine out of 10. So this is what we mean by we say divest, invest. Because right now, even if you are, if, even if you like the cops, just from a, from a, 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 a bandwidth position, they are being asked to do things they're not trained to do in social services, in healthcare, in domestic violence, in trauma services, in food security, in housing security. They don't have the capacity to do that, yet their coffers swell to perform functions that they actually cannot and are not trained to perform. That's number one. So if we take that logic and apply it to the same phenomena on campuses, where campus police are being asked to do the things that they are not able to do, what do we have? We have right now a two-tier policing system where one, a student and a resident commit the same infraction. The student sees the dean of students, and we know this to be true, and the resident goes through the criminal justice system. So we have a policing apartheid structure. So but what, but what do universities also have? They have internationally recognized medical facilities that currently right now focus more on boutique services and cancer research, plastic surgery, and they downsize their actual mandate for tax exemption, which is energy and care to surrounding communities. They actually get tax exemption for providing energy and care they currently do not provide. Also, every day, cafeterias and, and, and other eateries on campuses throw away food every day as a part of a health mandate. During the pandemic, a couple of schools, only during the pandemic, began to package that food into healthy meals for communities of need. But only during the pandemic, it's over now. Even though the pandemic is not over, but there, you know, it's over. The policy is over. So, so, so if we look at the capacity, housing, healthcare, food, and the needs of actual public safety, a divest invest framework is perfect for campus security. Because we, we we acknowledge that yes, there is a need for security, but right now that security structure, that policing structure is reactionary. It documents a crime. It doesn't pre pre prevent a crime. It doesn't create an ecosystem where crime is less possible. It comes in and it documents. Sometimes it creates it by documenting it. And it re, it re admits crime in the ways that it surveils and questions victims of crime. So if schools 
if we had a mandate that's every expansion, every housing expansion include affordable low income housing for residents, that they take the, the food they're going to throw away and repackage it into healthy meals for communities of need. If we actually require their multi million dollar medical facilities to actually engage in energy and care as is required in, in exchange for their tax exempt status. And we think about, well, what do we mean by divest invest? Trauma care, food security, housing security, professional services. Instead of in ramping up our uh, teams of armed police forces, how about teams of professional healthcare workers and healthcare workers in training? Talk about Ruth Gilmore's vision of what do we want? That's, that's what I want. Turning the university into a commons and actually forcing the institution to live up to the services that it claims to offer in exchange for its political, economic power and leverage in our lives. Schools make the claim of solving the world's most difficult problems. Isn't it crazy that they don't start with solving the problems that they actually have a hand in creating in their own backyards? That's what we should begin with, divest, invest. That's what abolition means to me on the campus, just to start. So I'll stop that. Absolutely, thank you. Um, others, um, again, thinking about your work in relation to this, uh, how does abolition show up for you as new possibilities that we can and should consider? So I try to talk about you know, an abolitionist liberatory instructional practice um, and, and kind of figuring out what that looks like within the context of teaching inside of prisons. And it's certainly nothing that, you know, I, I have concrete ideas about and, you know, it's nothing that uh, I've been able to publish, but it's just largely an idea that the very tenets that we think about when we think about abolition, freedom, liberation, those are the same tenets that should inform a very critical analysis of how we teach inside of the classroom. A lot of times, I don't think we pay enough attention to the fact that university professors are not trained to teach. We know that K-12 instructors go through many years of schooling and have to take all kinds of tests and have certifications. To teach in a university, all you need is a doctorate. And that's it. And, and sometimes you don't need that. And so when you're, you're bringing people into a classroom on the free world, who don't have the experience of teaching, who do not know how students learn, who do not understand brain development, who don't understand that there's a difference between teaching an 18 year old and a 21 year old and a 25 year old. When you take these people and you put them in a prison setting, it is just a recipe for disaster in many, many ways. When you take that Chaucer scholar who's been teaching the same course for 35 years and put them inside of a prison, they're not necessarily going to be as successful as they were on, um, as they were on the free world campus. And so there's so much about faculty training that higher ed in prison really is starting to kind of get an on-ramp onto that there is certainly movement that we are, that we're trying to make, but it's, it's slow going because folks don't want to admit they don't know how to teach. And that's fundamentally what we're having to say to some people, your teaching is trash. And that's why you can't work with this program anymore. And that's okay. That doesn't mean the person is trash. It just means that they can't teach and teaching is not for them. Um, and so when we're thinking about how we are presenting material to students and we're thinking about what material we're presenting, how we're presenting it, how do we introduce it? How do we contextualize it? How do we tie it into prior learning? How do we use what we're teaching to prep for future learning? All of these strategies that trained teachers know how to do, university professors largely have no idea about what's happening. And so in order to have, I think, a truly liberatory, abolitionist, freedom-centered approach to the work that we do inside of prisons, there has to be dedicated, deliberate, intentional training that not only talks about just the generalities of instructional practice, but also talks about the specific needs that folks have who are inside, because it also requires that you understand how culture is perpetuated inside. It requires that you understand the dynamics between 
peers in the classroom, between peers, between people in the classroom and the COs who might be sitting in on the classes. It requires a thorough understanding of all of these different pieces. And if all you've done is talk about Chaucer for 35 years, you're not going to be able to do it. And so when we're able to kind of put these different pieces together with people who are kind of on the same page about this liberatory praxis, then we're starting to make movement forward. Yeah, thank you, um, that Aaron. Uh, really, really critical, really important. So many points, right, that hit very, very much home to the training and preparation aspect, even of faculty and, you know, being in the college university setting now, primarily working with graduate students. Um, I think so much about the, the, the time difference, generational differences of both how students are oriented in this moment, but are asking questions that in many regards, right, our programs are ill-equipped to provide. And that is a deep source of frustration I see consistently around specifically this aspect of teaching uh, generally, but also specifically and well in ways that are inclusive and understanding of like the variety of contexts in which, you know, adult higher in, uh, education can happen. Um, Kamari and David, I want to bring you in here as well. Um, Kamari, your thoughts here. Yes, so um, I think being a, a Black feminist scholar who um, embraces and, and uh, wants to advocate for feminist abolition, and when I say feminist, I mean like uh, women of all genders or none, um, and that really centers uh, people are in a social position that is marginalized by race, class, gender, sexuality. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a getting more people in this research space to actively resist uh, carceral logics because of the heavy reliance through, a, through um, maybe more, more carceral anti-rape movements to, to think that the legal system was the only way to um, address and prevent. So it's first, a, it's first a trying to change the conversation and open more people up to uh, possibilities that could actually keep people safe. And then drawing on my own research with Black women, uh, that, none of my participants said we need more cops or we need nicer cops, but we need more education. So um, the education and prevention on college campuses around sexual assault shouldn't just be like a 15 minute session in your orientation program that you're going to forget because you're still trying to figure out where the dining hall is, but it should be a more uh, it should be more integrated into uh, coursework. It should be talked about um, in classes where we're talking about different aspects of structural oppression. If we're talking about um, how we should relate to each other. So it should be more integrated in the curriculum and there should be multiple opportunities for students to learn about uh, consent and healthy ways of relating through through intimate relationships and just like their personal relationships. Um, it also has to be more contextualized. So I think a lot of the prevention work uh, that's out there tries to make things gender, racial, class neutral. And it's exactly those power dynamics that make uh, black women in particular, my, my study more vulnerable to sexual, sexual violence. And so we really need to talk about the gendered racism that exists on our campus. You know, when black women and non-binary students talked about their experience of sexual violence, they preface that with, you know, times where nobody paid attention to their comments in their lab group because they were the only black woman or they had to be the spokesperson for all black people. So they saw it as, as a continuum that sexual assault exposure was just a, a, another part of it. And that the party spaces, there was no, the party spaces are still segregated and that black party spaces are often off campus 
And so that creates more vulnerability. So we need to provide more space on campus for, for black students, students of color to gather socially and to have that college experience. But we also need space just for black women and, non, and black non-binary and black trans women to gather to, because that's what my participant wanted the most. After sexual assault exposure, they wanted to talk to someone who could understand all the aspects of what they were going through and going to university systems. You're often, it's dominated by you know, student affairs, dominated by white women who, um, who may not, who, who don't have the capacity, always like the um, cultural readiness to identify with, with the issues that black women were struggling with. And so we need spaces for black women um, just to gather, to talk, to, um, to figure out how they wanna protect themselves. Um, because black women are full of solutions. And, um, and then lastly, um, there's so much more, universities are a site of possibility. I guess that's why I'm a higher education scholar, um, not a sociologist. <laughs> uh, and so there's so many possibilities and I really would like to see community university partnerships where we can use the expertise that we're building on our campuses around um, education about consent and healthy sexual experiences, helping people identify maybe they are in a harmful situation and giving them resources to get out of it. And I think if we could partner with local communities and, and live up to some of our you know, obligations to the community, um, because sexual assault doesn't only happen on campus and that's the only story you hear in, in the media. And there are black women who, you know, have other relationships to this campus, whether they're staff or, um, or uh, you know, employees or just people who live in this community who, um, who need those resources as well. And so we, sh we shouldn't just hoard, we shouldn't just hoard the expertise. I'd like to see, mm -hmm. um, and, and that sharpens the expertise, I believe, so. Thank you for that. Uh, David, uh, closing us up on this question, given your sort of long view, right, of things as they've existed, how do you imagine uh, abolition um, in the context of campus? Yeah, I, I really appreciate the question. I appreciate the through line through everyone who's spoken on this question already of the ways in which I think everyone in a different way has said that thinking like an abolitionist forces you to think about um, universities and wider communities as, as not distinct, as not separate, that there's not an out there where there's inequality and oppression and violence and problems. And then there's these things called universities where there is learning and self-discovery and people living on their own for the first time and all of these wonderful things that are often associated with universities and, and, and quite rightly, and we should aspire to have those things and to create those institutions. Um, but it creates this total false you know, dichotomy in which um, universities can present themselves as being totally opposed to logics of carcerality. And, and I, I'm thinking about the anthropologist Damien Sejoyner, who um, is critical of the ways that sometimes people use the term school to prison pipeline, because in his mind, it gives this false impression that um, of exactly what was just said. And, and I think what Aaron in particular said of that there are, you know, we want more schools and we want fewer prisons. And we can say that, but if our schools are, are more like prisons than they are like what we want them to be as schools, then, then is that really what, what we're after, right? We can think about something much bigger than that than just moving bricks from oppressive schools and, and back and forth between schools and prisons. Um, you know, I, I think of, you know, one example that, um, you know, in my own um, organizing work that I think um, is a great example of how thinking like an, an abolitionist uh, changes how you think about these things. Uh, a few years ago, the University of Michigan implemented what's called um, SPG 601.38. So it's a, a, a university-wide policy affecting university employees that you have to disclose if you are um, charged or convicted of a felony. Um, when it was first created, it was very unclear what types of uh, you know processes were in place, how they would evaluate that information. Um, 
uh, if that was something that you could, you know, it, it, it was it was completely untransparent and pitched as this sort of thing in the wake of a number of high profile sexual misconduct cases on universities, Larry Nassar, for example, um, that this is something the university needed because unfortunately there are just bad apples, there are sexual predators in our midst and the university just needs to know who those people are. And, you know, uh, through the graduate employees organizations with the union, we could look at that and say, look, this, this isn't actually, you know, first of all, this is going to have all sorts of collateral damage and, and you can't um, give us any sort of sense of how this is going to be used and that isn't going to be just, you know, a discriminatory policy based on the fact that the people who have criminal conviction histories are not representative of the people who have committed harm, right? It's, it's disproportionately people from communities that have been over-policed and divested from. And so, but even, even if it didn't have all of these sort of collateral effects and it wasn't this form of collateral consequences that Aaron's talking about, it also wouldn't do the things that the university says that it would do. Because the, the ways in which, you know, sexual violence, as Aaron, uh, as, excuse me, as Kamaria talked about, the ways in which sexual violence occurs on campuses is not this case of um, these sort of uh, predators that are lurking in the midst that once the university finds out who those people are, it's dealt with properly. We know from Larry Nassar, we know from Robert Anderson, we know from all of these high profile cases that these are people who were able to commit harm over long periods of time, decades in some cases, because they were protected by certain people at the university, because they had the types of, of privilege that meant that even in the case of, of Larry Nassar, when people went to the police, the police had no interest in investigating this because you know the, the, the uh, very credentialed white male doctor was not who they had in their mind as, as, a, as a public security problem, as, as a threat to people, right? Um, and so I think I, the thing I, th I think that's so helpful about thinking um, in terms of abolition is that we can say um, what Davari also said about campus policing, which is that not only does it do this other thing that the university doesn't want us to talk about, which is you know, uh, create forms of inequality and criminalization and violence and exclusion, but it also doesn't do the thing that they say they need it for, which is to keep people safe. And so it fails people on both sides of that. And I think that's the thing that is so um, powerful about thinking in terms of abolition is we, we stop trying to say, well, what's the least discriminatory or the most sort of flexible policy? And we say, no, it's someone's past conviction uh, an arrest history is not a good indicator of whether or not, you know, tomorrow they're going to likely commit harm against someone. And the fact that someone doesn't have a past arrest or conviction history is not necessarily an indication that there's someone who isn't going to commit harm. And so we can start thinking with the types of tools that, that you know, my co-panelists have, have talked about. And I think that's exactly where um, I'd like to see the conversation on universities go. Yes, thank you. Um, all excellent points. Um, I think that I would add to, right, to some of or I guess probably the majority of our conversation and, and necessarily so, is sort of focused on sort of this idea of crime and criminality in context of sort of this like carceral conversation. But I think also more expansively, right, also as a higher education scholar of like how abolition even applies to other pressing and intractable problems in higher education. I think we have a question um, specifically regarding uh, student loan and the debt crisis, right? And so when we think about this notion of higher education as a life affirming institution, well, when we think about the role that debt significantly plays in the inability right, to navigate sort of the existing capitalistic and wealth structure, that it's um, a deep and entrenched aspect or a part, as we've heard from folks around the debt collective and others organizing for debt liberation, um, right, that that too becomes a, a conversation for abolition, right, that how we think about access to higher education not being predetermined by one's access to capital or the access to acquiring debt, right, um, and even more so the fact that that debt is often at um, in, in more instances than not, if, if not all instances, right, a thing that students and families have to encumber and yet universities kind of get away scot-free with having nothing to say other than to use those monies as they see fit, which we know to be sure, right, are part of the problem with administrative bloat and expenditures with administrators and having their particular exorbitant salaries in some instances um, and other ways that it's underwrites aspects of profit making at the university. And so I think, you know, again, considering abolition as a framework, then we have to really talk about um, how students and families are financing their education. Right, and whether that should be uh, not just an entanglement, but an entrapment, right, to a sort of lifelong set of servitude into the profits of privatized companies. Um, even more so when we think about the disproportionate burden of that, right, falling largely to black and brown borrowers and families, um, especially black women, and the inability for them even 12 years out to pay down these loans because they're entering a racist, sexist labor market, 
right? These are all things that I think we really have to wrestle with and that abolition teaches us to ask, again, as we've all mentioned, different conversations, but also the presentation of different solutions other than like, well, if they just get jobs, they'll be able to pay this down, right? Um, opposed to why is it necessary to go to, into tens of thousands of dollars in debt to acquire a credential that may or may not actually serve its purpose because of how the rest of the world will view and value that credential, whether by institution type, right, which we know we privilege certain institution credentials over others, or the holders therein of the same credential as their white counterparts, but ultimately don't get quite as much mileage um, out of that. So I think that's also an intricate part, if you think about aspects of, um, you know, student uh, financing of their education. We could also apply this to any other aspects that have already been brought up with regard to housing, with regard to student conduct, um, even student engagement. We can think about grading, right, also as a vestige of punishment in the carceral system in certain regards. And I think this ties in particularly uh, well when we think about um, the most recent case that at least hit the airwaves uh, coming out of Georgia State Perimeter Campus in which two Black students themselves had police called on them by a professor who was also Black based on their tardiness to the class and, and being asked to leave and refusing to do so as those who paid tuition to be there, right? That even in that moment, as we've already talked about, police were expected to respond to a situation that did not require police, right? Certainly not armed officers, but that the intention there uh, was some level of like punitive sanction for failing to comply with the presumed or ascribed authority of a faculty member in that sort of powerful position, right, to dictate uh, the boundaries of their particular classroom, even though that place should really be ceded to the students and their right to engage in, in learning. Um, so I want to transition us, um, you know, with the brief time that we have with some of the questions that have come in, um, many of which are, are very much on top of the things that we've talked about in the conversation. Um, and so um, there's a particular question, and this often comes up about um, whether there has been any renewed movement about changing job specifications or qualifications to become a police officer, particularly in the context of campus, whether that's um, degrees and credentials, relevant training, um, and anyone who might want to speak to any understanding about how that conversation has evolved, but also perhaps the limitations, right, of that being um, what, you know, many in the abolitionist community would call like a non-reform reform, right? Um, anyone who wants to, to take a shot at that. So I'm always... I'm always very wary about any potential implication that like just educating them more will make their racism different um, mm -hmm. because it is not education that makes somebody racist um, and then exhibit racist and discriminatory behaviors. And so like I, you know, I teach inside, but I also teach on, um, you know, on a free world campus. And there are students on the free world campus who are majoring in criminal justice who want to go into law enforcement. And I would not be surprised if I saw some of these students in five years or so in a news story about police violence, police brutality, because the concept, the, con the conceptualization that they have of people um, who are breaking the law or as they see or perceive are breaking the law, those perceptions of those people are deeper than a degree. They're deeper than an associate's or a bachelor's or even a master's. And that's not to say that education can't help um, but I do want us to just be cautious about how much we expect you know, reading about Plato to make somebody not beat up Black people and shoot them in the streets. Thank you for that, um, Dr. Furbit. Um, critically important, right? And I think that that entanglement even right through criminal justice programs and criminology, which has been a long since the driver of the conversation about these things has now been sort of interrupted by some critical scholars in social sciences. Um, it's something that also has to be brought to task, right? Because that um, if we're thinking about the credential as a requirement, right, then the universities are dead center, right, in the facilitation, right, in the lack of interruption, right, this, um, what we call sort of like an intervention of sorts that would disrupt, if at all possible, this idea of like racist ideology and then how to think about that. Um, but again, can't disentangle that quite from the very racist foundations and perpetuations within the institution itself. Um, David, I want to turn to you. There's a question here about universities and whether they keep data on non-students they arrest, or maybe even more broadly, this notion of police interactions. And I know we had some sort of engagement with this as a result of our work on the task force, but anything you might share about uh, sort of data in relation to arrest and interactions? Yeah, I'll say, um, uh, and, and I think Charles will know this, uh, know this kind of stuff better than I can even, that, um, uh, you know, there are, um, you know, requirements around um, keeping certain data and also reporting certain data. Um, some of it comes through, 
mandates from the Department of Justice because the you know or or state justice departments because these are sworn police forces that are um, you know carrying a badge under the color of law. Um, and some of it comes through um, Department of Education stuff. And so there are, you know, there's, I think there's, um, you know, it's not as though no one's sort of thinking about that or no one's sort of um, aware of the trajectory that Devarian sketched for us of, of the rapid expansion of, um, of policing and the, and the tools and jurisdiction that goes with it. Um, I think what we find, certainly this was the case of the University of Michigan, and I think this is true in a lot of places, is that those things aren't always being met. There's not a lot of oversight. Um, and there's only so much you can sort of do in terms of the data that's available. I mean, you, you can find um, through, the Michigan, through the state of Michigan, you can find data on who the Division of, of Public uh, Safety and Security arrests, um, the demographics that are associated with those people. And we can see that it's it's disproportionately uh, black students at the University of Michigan, even though it's a, an overwhelmingly white campus. Um, but that that fact and that sort of stat doesn't necessarily go as far as as we might like it to. I think. Um, and, and so thinking about the question also about education, I think you know, what I guess what I would add to to Aaron's response, which was wonderful, um, is that you know. Even if we had, you know, could create a situation in which every campus police officer is non-racist and doesn't harbor, um, you know, a discriminatory mindset or something like that, um, if the fundamental functions that we that we want police to do, which you know, as Devarian said, is to actually um, make universities look good and clear the way for university expansion into black and brown communities. It doesn't matter how you staff that department. It doesn't matter what types of reporting you do if the fundamental function stays the same. Um, and so I think that those are the types of, you know, thornier but more fundamental questions we have to ask that I think um, get us closer to the root of things than, um, you know, dabbling in, in different ways of credentialing or um, reforming certain uh, police union contracts or some of these reforms that are, are often floated that I think you know, may not be, um, you know, some of them may not be counterproductive, at, at, but that's, I think, the best that you can say about a lot of those types of reforms is that, is that they miss the, the root cause and, and some of Thank them you. are actually counterproductive. For sure. Thank you uh, for that, that framing. Um, we have another question um, that's asking whether we could speak to um, the use of campus police to police community members seeking health care in university hospitals. Um, and I'm wondering if uh, maybe Kamari, given some of your work and sort of the intersection of that, if that's something that you might be able to speak to. Um, and this is kind of particular to um, experiences at, at the UM hospital, but I know that this would be true also at other hospitals that are located in sort of the primary service, uh, speaking of it to, more to the variance point, but any thoughts on that? Well, sure, yes. So I, I can't speak to the context of uh, university hospitals, but at, in my work as a rape survivor advocate in Chicago, um, I would accompany uh, survivors um, and, and child survivors and their, and their parents with, through um, the treatment exams and, and the police are always called um, regardless of whether the person wants that be, um, and that's a part of the victims' rights movement that uh, that emerges out of a more carceral anti-rape movement, where uh, police presence is police are are um, deeply intertwined with the process of seeking medical care after mm -hmm. sexual assault, and you know, in my role, I was often having to and not always successfully try to like defend uh, the survivor against you know, well, a police officer or detectives mm. and observing some very um, uncomfortable interactions and, um, and seeing further that the police aren't the answer. Um, so I think we need to re-examine some of our uh, policies at the state level, because that's how rape and sexual assault is dealt with 50 different ways across mm -hmm. all the states. And then you have your campuses that are, you know, doing somewhat different things. 
but we need to re-examine the, um, the intertwinedness of um, police with just seeking medical resources, but also um, the connection between police and Title IX um, or carceral logics and Title IX. I think every survivor should be able to talk to a confidential resource first and know that person is confidential and uh, to be able to learn about what all their options are and particularly what resource options. And we need to offer more resources, particularly as it pertains to um, academic accommodations because I've talked to survivors who have been more harmed by their institutions and whose mm. lives have been ruined more because of institutional lapse in policy than a sexual assault. That's what precipitated it, but the university continued it. And so we just need to re-examine um, how we're not, how we think that adjudication and punishment is the only way we can respond. Thank you for that. Um, so for our last uh, audience question um, here, there's um, some focus on uh, the current transition to what's known as the triple helix model, or the transition of the interrelations between university, government, and industry. And so um, referencing, you know, uh, Dr. Baldwin's model guard to campus police as stormtroopers of expansion. Question is, what are the long term implications of this triple helix dynamic? Um, and how can student bodies and communities that who are affected by this have a voice in the conversation? Um, and so to respond to that question, I think, you know, aspects of this, again, raise very important questions of how the university's entanglement with government and industry facilitate not just the, the notion of an institution of policing, right, but also the military industrial complex. And I think part of this conversation has to sort of um, raise questions of how the pursuit of profit through funded research, particularly through Depart Department of Defense contracts, right, and also through pharmaceutical and other relations, um, you know, sort of set the precedent, right, and set the stage for um, inherently disproportionate consequences. And so I think about whether we're talking through, uh, you know, broken windows theory, right? As something that, that finds its uh, origination in part through uh, research that happened at the university. Also these new sort of uh, versions of um, predictive policing to a certain extent, right? That are also emerging out of faculty research. Uh, I think yeah, the University of Nevada, um, Las Vegas, I believe. Um, that are being uh, expected to be particular types of models that also consistently fail, but even more so how institutions incubate, right, the expansion of the empire as a whole, right, that because of the way that we think about uh, uh, recognition and reward structures in the academy, right, encourages faculty to pursue these types of uh, grants um, in line with their research, right, that also props up the university, but also sustains uh, individual faculty careers, right, um, contributions to salary and other, other things of that nature. Um, and so I think we have to ask, if the university is to be considered a place uh, in primarily in service to the public good, who constitutes the public and to what extent has that been co-opted by government and industry under the guise of a sort of public offering that really is about privatization, it really is about expansion of empire. Um, and I think that that has to be called to question disrupted that also deprioritizes the types of grants and pursuits that we often see. We can think about, you know, as even earlier examples, the relationship of the National Institute of Health with university hospitals and what that plays into in terms of relationship for things say um, like Henrietta Lacks, right? And sort of the, the longstanding exploitation of her genes by this sort of triple helix environment. Um, so I think all of these things are important to consider of how these things work and interplay. But again, how the university is not just a facilitator, um, but a, a um, intricate part, right? Of how these things work together to expand the things that fundamentally do harm to disenfranchised and vulnerable communities, not just in the United States, but really around the world. Um, and so with that, um, I just want to take our panelists, maybe just in one minute, anything that you'd like to leave us with before we close out here. Um, and maybe we'll start with Kamaria, then to David, and then to Aaron. Oh, yes. Um, so as higher education institutions, we have, the, we have the ability to create capacity and to um, create education programs, uh, professional programs, to address these issues. And I think campuses need to show what um, need to actually invest in providing uh, culturally responsive um, care to black women by you know, maybe creating a whole degree program that, pri that um, 
that accompany scholarships to Black women who want to do this work and giving them the tools to, to do it and thereby serving um, a population that is in need. And so I think we just, we need to think about what it is we do, what, what are we, um, what are we charged to do in society and act more um, with, with courage and vision um, and not just be reactive because you're trending on Twitter or there's an account exposing assaulters on your campus. Um, and so I, I'm encouraged by what Michigan is doing. They're creating this community coordination response team um, that you know my PI is uh, a, gonna be a co-leader on and bringing our research to this work um, and, and definitely looking at the gaps in how Michigan uh, approaches sexual assault. And that's a five-year investment. And hopefully it goes beyond its mandate of five years. Um, so that's something I'm hopeful for. But to the question, I, I don't have any concrete examples yet because I've got a lot of expectations. Thank you, Kamari. David? Yeah, I guess very briefly, I'll say I think this what this panel is really affirming for me and underscoring for me is how much knowledge and and thought and practice is already going on at universities and and at by university educated you know educators and people so i think um you, you know universities don't need to hire uh outside consulting firms and you know whatever other types of of uh public relations management uh solutions are often available and, and the default i mean there's so much such a wealth of of uh, amazing and, and, and engaged people who are doing this work already um, at U of M and at so many other institutions that I think um, uh, I, recognizing that I think uh, you know, goes a long way towards beginning um, a better conversation. Great, thanks, David. Uh, Dr. Corbett, rounding us out. Yeah, I think the, the thought I wanna leave with folks is that the, the importance and the power of community organizing, whether it's around providing educational programs inside, whether it's helping to figure out the relationship between the university and the community, the role of community organizing on campus with students as well as off campus in the community cannot be emphasized enough. It is only through the power of the community, it's only through leadership development in our community that we're going to be able to have our message heard. I mean, imagine the Congressional Black Caucus Institute has their criminal legal system reform agenda informed by GEO, which is a company that invests in for-profit institutes. Yes. Again, the Congressional Black Caucus Institute has a criminal justice agenda that is informed by private prisons. And so if we're not organizing around things like that and around many of the other things that, that this panel has talked about, then we're not doing anything really, to be honest. Um, and so we really have to bring people on board alongside the work that we're doing so that it's not just, you know, once Charles is gone, it's done. Or, you know, once Kamaria is gone, it's done. We have to keep building and building and investing in the next generation of organizers and activists and advocates to get some of this change happening. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Again, uh, just thank you to all of my esteemed colleagues and panelists, guests for joining us. Uh, we very much appreciate your time and energy and contributions as well. If you'd like to keep up with Campus Abolition Research Lab, you can visit us at policefreecampus.com forward to check up on our projects as well as follow us on Twitter at Police Free World. And with that, I will turn it back over to you, Brother Keenan. Uh, thank you all. Wow, uh, this has been fantastic. This is, I love my job. All right. Thank you so much for everyone here, uh, Drs. Davis, Baldwin, Corbett, uh, soon to be Drs. Porter and Helps. Uh, I just really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for your time and a very engaging conversations. And for the work that you're doing to inform the knowledge and action to address campus, uh, college campus policing. Thank you to the NCID event producing staff and team. Thank you for joining this conversation today. Please help us out by completing the brief and anonymous survey that will pop up on your browser after this event ends. We encourage you to continue the conversation with us and each other and stay tuned for future events. Have a
have a fantastic day.